Thanks for downloading the show. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. If this is your first time here, it's me and my friends talking about stuff that you probably like as much as I do. It's fixing stuff, it's growing stuff, and if your microwave oven is broke, you don't throw it out, you fix it, right? So here today to tell me how to fix my microwave oven is my friend Aaron from The Impatient Gardener. Hi, Eric. How do I fix my microwave, Aaron? I have no idea. I cannot help. That's why I'm watching your YouTube videos. I have no idea how to fix my microwave oven or, or yours. The, the, some of the commenters told me how to fix it in a really nice way, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> See, there you go. You got everything you need right there. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's a couple guys. Long story short, everyone, I, uh, I just put out a video about trying to fix my microwave oven. And... There were some cranky people, which there always are. Anything I do electrical, anything involving electricity brings out this group on YouTube. Um, But then there's this other group that is like, good start, Eric. Why don't you try testing this? Or you should have tested that. And, you know, when I had this, I tested the micro switches in the door and that was it. So the good guys outweigh the cranky ones. Well, that's sort of how it is in life in general, I think. The good people and the good guys and the people who are, aren't are having a bad day generally outweigh the people who are. Yeah. The problem on like television now and these screaming political shows is that the, the crazy 2% get their message out, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> While you and I are normal and having too much, we're, we're too busy, uh, you know, making a living and making sure the sidewalk is shoveled. So. <laughs> right. Speaking of electrical problems, you know who's having some electrical problems is Garden Fork friend Will Wallace, who oh. <laughs> it keeps getting in trouble because he keeps making the same joke of putting an outlet in sinks and showers. And a lot of people get very concerned. <laughs> it's a fake outlet and people don't know that. And then they get really upset with him. <laughs> so in Will's Instagram feed and on his uh, The Weekend Homestead is the Instagram feed and also on Facebook... He uh, tiled a bathroom in a shower, a walk-in shower, and he put a fake electrical outlet in, just he glued it onto the tile and then took a picture. And he did the same thing with a with an undermount sink in the kitchen as well. And he got all this traffic on Reddit and he landed on the front page of Reddit with people arguing about whether it was Photoshopped in or whether that was an actual outlet and whether it violated electrical codes or not. <laughs> So he'll be on the show to talk about that. (laughs) I just think it's really funny that that many people take it that seriously because they must really think Will is really off his rocker. Well, that kind of comments on our society and our in Washington, D.C. right now. You know, it's just like they kind of they they just kind of go for the sensational. And meanwhile, but the little out of a little caveat here, Will, uh, we text all the time because he lives in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota there. And um, he uh, that's not a bad thing, by the way. <laughs> but um, some uh, nefarious Instagram and Twitter accounts um, copied his image and put it out as their own. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. for the, So the clickbait uh, <sighs> Twitter and Instagram mean people uh, took it and ran with it. Which was oh, cool. that's well, that's really a drag when that happens. Um, and it happens, I think, to anyone who puts anything out on yeah. Instagram and Facebook. People steal images all the time. And it's really um, it's it's really just a drag because people who make those images have to go if they care, which they do. They have to go chasing those down. And then you have to make um, disputes to the service that they're put on. And yeah. it's it's a lot of time for nothing. And it's. You know, the general rule is, just so everyone knows, you can't just take someone's image and reuse it without their permission. Yep. Their explicit permission to reuse it. And then, at the very least, you need to give them credit. And yeah. sometimes you need to do more than give them credit. But you have to ask first. And most people are so nice about it and just say, absolutely, please use it. But yeah. please give me credit. And then everybody's good. NBC News, actually, uh, one of their... Uh... I can't remember what show it was, but they were like, oh, we're doing a thing about a uh, B desk. Could we use some of your video? And I'm like, if you want to pay me, sure. And they're like, oh, we don't have any money. I'm like, you're NBC, the network. Right. So I was just like, and then 
somebody else wanted to do uh, use some B dead bee footage about, oh, I'm doing a video about pesticides and how they kill bees. Can I use this stuff from your video? I'm like, no, because these bees didn't die from pesticides. Right. So it's interesting how, um, anyway. Well, I'm glad they asked, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, the ticket is at least they came and asked. Yeah. What so. a tangent here. So we're actually here to talk about uh, garden soil tests and arthritis in your dogs and um, maybe the new Japanese market that I went in the other day and bought a bunch of stuff. Great. So what do you want to talk about first? Soil tests? Well, you did some, uh, well, first of all, you have a website and a YouTube channel all called the impatient gardener and you can write garden articles. Well, just your writing in general is so much better than mine and engaging. I'm like, Oh, what did Aaron write about this week? You know, and I'm just sucked into the website. Um, but you did some garden soil tests and I thought people on garden fork would like to hear about that. Yeah, I did. Um, so, First of all, my caveat is I think anybody who's into gardening has probably been told at some point, oh, go get a soil test. And I think people kind of roll their eyes at that because it sounds like a really difficult process. So I made a YouTube video in which I'm trying to show you just how easy it is to do a soil test. And when I say a soil test, I'm talking about like a real soil test where you send it off to a soil lab, not one of these not one of these quickie deals where you um, go to the hardware store and get all the little tubes and put your soil in there. I mean, those are okay for little checks, but if you want to really get a picture of what your soil is all about, you should just send it off to a soil lab. Um, so, so yeah, so basically I did this video and I just show you how to um, take soil from a couple of different places. In this case, I was testing the soil in my new vegetable garden and that was all soil that I had purchased last year. And I mean, technically I had an idea of what was in that soil because I purchased a special blend and they told me what the percentages of it were, but you know, you don't ever really, really know what you're getting. Yeah. I learned so the hard I, way that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought it would be a good idea to just quick test it before spring. Um, and actually I, I, you can do a soil test anytime your soil is not frozen, you can grab soil. And it's a really good time to do that because come spring, everybody says, oh, I have to test my soil. And then the soil labs get you know, overwhelmed and it takes a little longer to get your results back. But it's simple. You just basically every soil lab has very clear instructions so you can follow the instructions. It's just a matter of um, taking a few different samples from a few different areas in the area in which you're testing, I mean, if you ha think you have significantly different soil or you're growing something significantly different in a different area of your garden, you should do an entirely separate test for that. But this way, I just kind of went around to each of my garden beds or four of them or something and grabbed a little bit less than a cup of soil, mixed that all up, sent that off to the soil lab, and then uh, filled out the little form that they give you and um, paid my... Uh, it was 15 bucks for the, and I think this is pretty average for a soil test. Cost me $15. I sent mine to the University of Wisconsin Soil Lab, and I paid an extra $3 then because I also got a calcium and magnesium test done as well. Um, most soil labs, if you're looking for a soil lab, start with your local um, public university, your probably your state public university. Yay. Most of them have... Um, soil labs associate with them and that's kind of the easiest way to find a soil lab uh, in your area and it's important to not like if you're near, if you're in California you don't want to send your soil sample to Wisconsin because the people in your state the soil experts in your state will have a much better idea of what they're looking for and and what is common there so that's a little caveat there but anyways then I got my soil test back and I found out what was in there I was going to ask you at first what was in there, but I wanted to hear the story. So there you go. So it was not a big surprise. There was nothing earth shattering in there. The one surprise that I had, and it was a little bit of a disappointment is that one of the things that I struggle with here is that our soil is alkaline. Mm -hmm. Most plants want to grow in soil that is neutral to a little bit acidic either end of the spectrum is not good for most plants. So I struggle a lot of times with the alkalinity in our soil. And I was hoping that because I purchased the soil that that would be, it would be more towards neutral. It turns out that the, the pH is, is 7.4, which is 
is um, a, at least a little bit alkaline, right. and and it's actually borderline quite alkaline. So um, that was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, it's, it's not a huge deal, um, and I, I will probably um, I will probably apply some uh, sulfur to attempt to adjust that just a little bit more towards neutral. And there's a whole in the post I did on this, which I'm sure you'll probably give a link to so people can go straight there. Of course I there's will. A whole there's a whole calculation as to how you can, how much sulfur you need to apply to change your pH. So that's always a good thing to get an idea of what you need to apply um, because you don't want to be willy-nilly throwing a bunch of stuff in your garden. You want to have some idea of what it needs to do what you're trying to accomplish. I actually was going to ask if I could get my soil tests now, but my raised beds are rock solid. If I got, if I dug it out, like if I hit the dirt with my flamethrower and I thawed it, would that be okay? Or, or... Yeah, that should be, I think that would be fine. I mean, that's, yeah, that's the main thing is that you just need to be able to dig the dirt out. And that's the only real, that's the only real caveat there. Because there's clearly, I can just tell by uh, working the beds that I have six raised beds and the soil is, at least in two of them, is quite a bit different than the other. And you were talking about the soil that you bought. I have um, a neighbor uh, I bought, um, he says, oh, I have mushroom compost and he's a contractor, uh, out, you know, outdoor landscaping contract. And I'm like, oh, great. And so he drove over and with his uh, front end loader and dropped it right in the beds it was perfect. But what I didn't think about was that the mushroom compost had been outside and not covered and it was full of weed seeds. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's something that also one, you know, just consider is has it been a lot of places will steam their soil, garden soil or compost to kill all the weed seeds before they deliver it to you. But uh, this being the neighbor, I, you know, fine, you know, lesson learned. But Well, you could also, you know, you could solarize that to take care of that problem too, which would be, you know, um, black plastic over the top of it. Yep. And, um, you know, keep it on there. It depends. There's a certain... Um, I don't know off the top of my head, you know, there's a certain temperature you want to keep it at for a certain amount of time that should kill certainly all the annual weed seeds at least. Um, and then some of the perennial ones can be a little, can be a little tougher, but that's one way to, to deal with that when you, if you run into that problem. What I've moved more toward now is um, the back to Eden gardening method with wood chips on top of everything. That's, there is more and more, um, evidence coming out and more scientific papers coming out about how important wood chips are. And the wood chips, by the way, that are preferred for this are what they call arborist chips, uh -huh. which tend to be all the stuff. Like if a, if someone comes and cuts down a tree and throws all the branches through, there's some green bits in there and there's, you know, some woody bits in there. It's not like bark mulch that right. you buy at the store. And those, um, break down really well. And, there is so much evidence that you just put on a healthy layer of that on top of your soil. Do not dig it in. Just leave it there and, you know, dig a hole, spread it apart and stick your plants inside of there if you need to. And it will break down eventually, do wonderful things for your soil. And um, and it's pretty easy, too. Yeah, it's wicked simple in my town because the, uh, the arborist guys, the tree fellers who – the town lets them drop their wood chips over by the road crew garage. And then everyone just drives over there with their truck or their quad with a trailer or something. It's this tiny little town. You, you don't need to have a license to drive anything. <laughs> you know, right. you just tool down the road. And I, I throw my trailer on my quad and I run down the road and um, you just have free wood chips. Uh, a lot of white pine with the needles but also deciduous trees as well but i did that for the garlic beds and the tomato bed and i'm i'm psyched because the garlic has always gotten overwhelmed by weed seeds because i have clover in the yard there and you know the, mm -hmm. the clover will drop in you know scatter into the so that's all good to know i did a couple of videos about wood chip gardening or back to eden gardening and um there's a youtube channel called i think it's called back to nature i'll link to it this uh, couple up in Canada that are, they're not homesteading. They're, they're homesteading, but they also shop at the grocery store kind of thing. And I think their videos are really well done. And they talk about that method as well. 
You know, just um, one other resource, and I have not personally used this, but I've read a lot about it. There is a, a service, and this is apparently nationwide, and you can go to a website called Chip Drop. And what it does is try to link arborists who are trying to get rid of chips with homeowners who want a load of chips, and it's free. Oh, neat. Um, so um, I don't know a lot about it. Like I said, I've not personally used it. My understanding is, you know, it's one of those things where you have to have a big spot reserved and you get what you get. It's not like you can call them and say, oh, I only want, you know, a couple of yards. No, you're going to get a load. You're going to get a dump trucks full of chips and you need to tell them where they need to put them and they'll stick them there. But it's a great opportunity if people are looking for that um, and get that stuff for free. And what a fabulous way to sort of, you know, take care of a problem where someone's trying to get rid of something and someone else needs it. Something to consider there, um, which I learned, well, we learned when we were our young, uh, when I was kids, we learned uh, the hard way is the uh, truck came to drop the chips and there's a ditch, you know, between the road and the yard. And this big dump truck, he's like, I'm not going in your yard. He dropped it right there in the ditch. So we had a lot of shoveling to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. So just quickly, I just want to, because I know you're going to just keep going off. I want to just quickly talk about calcium and magnesium in my soil. So the reason I tested those things is that a lot of times um, people will talk about problems with vegetables and people add things um, when they're growing vegetables. So with so a lot of times people add Epsom salt and there is a whole bunch of people out there who will tell you that Epsom salt is the best thing you can do in your garden. And the answer is... Epsom salt is only needed if your soil is low on magnesium. And so one of the reasons oh, so I tested it. So it's not magic. <laughs> well, I mean, no, technically it's not. So so that's one of the reasons I tested that was just to eliminate. I didn't have any expectation that this soil would be low on either calcium or magnesium. But I wanted to just rule that out as a as a problem. So which it did. It's it's in fact both of them came back on my soil test as being quite high. Um, so there's absolutely no need to worry about a, def a magnesium deficiency. And the same with calcium. A lot of people think that um, everyone everyone wants to grow great tomatoes and a lot of people struggle with blos blossom end rot. And there's sort of this misunderstanding with blossom end rot that it's caused by a lack of calcium. So people do things like add tums to the soil like tums oh. the thing that you take when you have a stomach ache yeah, or seashells or or, or seashells and all, all kinds of things and um you know unless your soil is deficient in calcium and i don't believe by the way i don't think either one of those is really the best way if you do need to add calcium to your soil i don't think either one of those is the best way to do it but unless your soil is deficient in calcium um that's not that's not something you have to do and blossom end rot is really caused by a watering problem. It's an inconsistent watering problem. So what happens is calcium is needed in all parts of the plant. So the plant takes up calcium. And if there's a period where there's no water, suddenly you get the calcium sort of stops moving up the plant. And of course, the last place the calcium has to get to is the fruit because it moves its way up yeah. through the stem, down the branch, through the leaves. And so what happens is when there's this random amounts of sort of you know, there's too much water and then there's not enough water and inconsistent watering causes that blossom end rot. By the way, sometimes blossom end rot will pop up in the first fruits that you have and then it just kind of dissipates after that. So if you, the first tomatoes you pick have blossom end rot, don't freak out and like pull your plants out or something because there's a good chance that that problem will um, diminish or disappear throughout the season. And having wood chips over your tomatoes uh, would even out the moisture dehydration of your soil, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Abs mulch is the single best way to, to keep your soil um, at a, a more steady moisture. So that's a great – because, you know, I get it. It's not – sometimes you just get to your garden when you get to your garden. I mean, yeah. we all we all garden – most of us all garden in the real world in which sometimes you have a really busy week and you can't get to your tomatoes you know, every other day to water them or there's suddenly a big rain and then you sort of forget for a while, whatever. So mulch kind of covers up, you know, helps with all that. I did kind of a, I made a wood chip uh, mulch raised bed on steroids when Troy built sent me the chipper shredder for my um, blueberry plants. Cause uh, my blueberry plants were kind of in the, the kind of weedy part of the yard 
and I, um, they sent me, and that was a sponsored video. They sent me the chipper shredder and asked me to make a video about it. And I had a lot of fun doing it, but I, I built a raised bed around the blueberry pants plants. I weed whacked all the weeds down as low as I could to the ground. And then I put cardboard. I actually put the shipping box that the, that the chipper shredder came in because it was so big. I put two layers of card, card cardboard down, then the wood chips on top. And I think that's kind of the ultimate in um, wood chip cardboard mulch. And, and that, I have not seen any weeds come up at all. So it's very nice. That's see. There you go. Great. Yay. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to, drop the dollars and test each of my raised beds. Cause I think I, I'm very curious to see what they're about. Cause one of them, the dirt's very Brown and would well, not just kind of like a light Brown and it looks like a clay. And I, one of my neighbors, you know, said, Oh, I have some garden soil and he brought it over and I put it in and I wasn't there when he dropped it. And I'm like, Oh, I wish I would have looked at this before they brought it over, you know? <laughs> So, you know, the nice thing about getting a soil test from a soil lab is that they come back and give you suggestions for what you should do. Because one of the things you do when you fill out these forms is you tell them, what am I trying, what are you trying to grow there? And so they will come back and give you the suggestions. And then they often will link to additional articles or places to get additional information on it. But I think if you're willing to spend the money on that, I think that'd be a really interesting exercise to compare what you're seeing and how that equates to what they find in a soil test. So a left curve here on soil tests, um, because I live in New York City during the week, and one of my best friends, Brian, where I keep my honeybees, he is a young child, and I helped him renovate his uh, row house, and he's like, I'm going to test the backyard. I'm going to get a soil test, because he's a gardener as well. And he got the regular soil test, but he also got the toxicity test as well, and the lead and chromium in the soil was off the charts. Oy. Which is normal in New York City, I've learned, because of two things. Um, every neighborhood in Brooklyn had its own incinerator for a very long time before they had uh, where they would load it onto barges and you know ship it somewhere else. And also the backs of the houses are, um, well, the row houses are brick. They would paint the brick with lead paint. That lead paint would chip off and fall back into the, the yard. So the soil had lead and chromium in it from that. So he actually dug out a foot, a friend, another friend is like an echo engineer guy. And he dug out a foot of soil that was removed safely into a covered dumpster. And then he laid down this heavy duty landscape fabric and brought in a foot of topsoil from Long Island. And so he has a lead free backyard. Wow, that's quite a project. All done with five gallon Home Depot buckets. Oh my gosh! Because you can't you can't get a machine back there. It's a, the row houses are all connected, so there's no way to get a machine back there. Wow. You know, another thing I guess somebody could do in that situation, depending on what type of gardening they wanted to do, is um, and depending sort of you know why they wanted to get that out of there. I mean, if I had my kids running around on that on the grass, I don't know if I love that yeah. but if you're just worried about from a gardening you that's when you could go to like a raised bed thing and bring yep. your you know essentially get your new soil in via a raised bed it's funny because we actually ended up building raised beds with some of the lumber that we recycled out of the building these the dimensional two by sixes which are phenomenal oh um, wow and we did the lasagna gardening method where we put in cardboard and then compost and then uh, spoiled vegetables from the food co-op and then straw and those those beds are doing really well i'll link to that video as well here but if you just go to garden fork youtube type in garden fork lasagna gardening um that will be there it's 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 done very well great all these things would you like to move on to my dog's arthritis poor charlie pup yeah so uh my labradors are getting older uh, Henry, who is 12 years old, I think will live forever, even though she's the biggest weirdo in the world. Um, she will not make eye contact with you unless you're holding a piece of food. Um, other than that, she won't make eye contact. She doesn't really like to snuggle. You know, she sleeps in her own bed. She doesn't want to sleep with you. But my younger lab, Charlie Pup, is nine, and she is uh, like uh, uh, the the uh, spiker on the volleyball team, you know? Just nonstop energy girl. Always has played very hard. Always in the woods running around chasing things. 
but she had a stroke a while ago and that uh, compromised her rear legs to where we call her wobbles. She's kind of wobbly. And now she has arthritis in her front paws and it's gotten really bad to the point if she overdoes it on the weekend, you know, the weekend warrior thing, she can't walk on Mondays. So, uh, well, she couldn't walk the other Monday and that was kind of a giant red flag for us. So I've had this yeah. crash course in arthritis and um, they're on, uh, she's getting an NSAID, N-S-A-I-D called, I can't remember the name of it now. <laughs> it comes in a blue box, but it's <laughs> it's uh, anti-inflammatory. And I got a harness for her because she just, she's okay once she's up on her feet, but when she's lying down, the first thing in the morning, she has a hard time getting up. So I have this harness that it goes around her front legs and it has these Velcro straps and it has like a, like a handle with straps so I can help her get up. She's 80 pounds, so I can help her get up and she's okay. And I'll link in the show notes because a lot of these slings you see that they sell on Amazon are junk. And then this one's quite good and it was only $35. So but I, I think I, that if you have a big dog, by the way, just a side note on that, I think if you have a big dog, I think everybody should think about owning something like that yeah. um, or know where they'd buy one if they need one in a hurry because you can use a towel as a sling in a pinch. But these things, I mean, that's that's to get you through like a day. So I think it's always a we have one we keep around um, because you just never know when you're going to have an emergency. Right. I mean, if they, you know, they break their back leg all of a sudden, you're like, OK, how do we get them in the car? Right. <laughs> But I was, because so I asked you about, you know, different uh, arthritis treatments, and you mentioned an injectable one. Yeah, we used um, Adequin on one of our, so our dogs, our last four dogs have been Newfoundlands. And so, um, you know, obviously they're enormous, big dogs. So um, with one of our dogs who had had a lot of orthopedic problems throughout his life, when he got older, um, he was really having, he was having a tough time and the vet, um, we were going to at the time suggested we give him adequate, um, injections. And, and he had, he had said, um, you know, you need to understand that this is a drug that, you know, if you use it for a very long time, it can have some negative effects, but our dog was 10. Um, new phones don't live much beyond 10 in general. Um, you're pretty lucky after 10, huh. some do. Um, so, you know, we knew this was sort of a, this was sort of a, um, it wasn't something we were going to have him on for five years. You know, we knew right. this was, you know, hopefully we'd have him on this for maybe two or three years. And um, he, w what we did was um, some vets like to give those injections themselves, um, but there's no reason you really have to do that. We just gave them to him subcutaneously. Um, just, you know, kind of in the skin on his, by his shoulder blades, they taught us how to do it. And we did that every three weeks and it made a huge difference. It was really, it, it was really the difference and it is what gave us, you know, I don't remember how long we had him on it, but it certainly gave us a year or two extra with him yeah. that we wouldn't have had otherwise. It's definitely hard moving a bigger dog if you have stairs, so... Yeah, that's and we have stairs coming into our house. We and we built ramps. I mean, we did. People, we all do a lot for our dogs. We love our dogs. We do what we what we can for them. And I think that's we all owe that to our dogs when they bring us as much happiness as they do. But so that's what that's the direction we went with that. Um, we actually could not give him NSAIDs because he had had some bad reactions to some. Oh, all right. Previously, so we were um, we were you know a, a little bit out of options. And Adequin came along, and that was that was a great. It worked really well for us. Yeah. Um, everyone has their own experiences. I do know um, other dog owners who have had good luck with it as well. It is not cheap, but a lot of these things aren't. My uh, physical therapist uh, just kind of out of the blue said, "You know, what about CBD oil for your for your Labrador arthritis?" And I, I. Don't know anyone that does that, but if any of you listening, I'd like to hear about that. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. So you can evidently, um, you can just put some drops on their paws as a topical treatment, you know, for, for where they have the pain. And then they'll also lick it so they get some of the CBD oil in their system as well. So I was curious if anyone has found that to be effective. Yeah, I'd love to hear. I'd love to see what people have to say about that. I've heard good things about it. I personally don't know anything about it either, but, um, boy, it'd be wonderful if there was, 
um, if if that was a viable option for some dogs. Rick Kennerly's talking back at the podcast right now. I'm sure he is. He'll be Hi, back Rick. soon. He has a really bad cold, and so um, trying to trying to talk while you're trying to cough is difficult. Um, so he'll be back on. I want to hear more about his new Prius, the the half battery, half engine one. So I'm very curious about that. Good. So there is um, in Brooklyn here. There is a series of warehouses with piers along the bay, the harbor that were kind of fell into disrepair and then they became uh, some small manufacturing there. And a company that if you've been to Manhattan, the Chelsea markets um, was the Nabisco baking company. It took up a full city block, which is, you know, in other words, you know, like Macy's department store is a full city block. This thing's a, uh, they rebuilt Chelsea market and made it thriving. And now they have invested in industry city in my neighborhood, which is many times the size of a city block. And they have a food hall there, and so there's, it's it's really quite nice. <laughs> so there's all of a sudden there's Indian food, Thai food, um, all sorts of different things in my neighborhood, which in there or, where there's not nothing before. But a Japanese food market opened up called Japan Village, and half of it is a series of food kiosks where you can get ramen or noodles or, is it called onigiri? It's the the ball of rice that's wrapped in seaweed and has salmon in it or a pickled plum or something. And they have bento boxes and sushi. And then the other half is a, gro- a Japanese grocery store, which three quarters of the stuff is all in Japanese. So I don't really know what it is, but there <laughs> are some English stickers on them to say what it is. And um, I've been buying, I bought a really high end soy sauce and I think it actually tastes better. I don't know. Maybe just, I don't know about the price of that, but I bought some, it's called, uh, ko- kwai, koi dashi sauce, which is a soup base for a lot of different Japanese uh, stews and soups. And I took a picture of it and I put it on Instagram. And somebody said, oh, I use this all the time for cooking and pointed me to um, Kenji Lopez Alt. He has a couple articles about using this on Serious Eat. So I want to read about that. So that'd be kind of interesting. No, oh, that's great. That's always, I think, when you can find those those little places that have um, those ingredients that you can't get normally, uh, that's that's always fun. And I've been using i i i have I make miso anyway, but I've just been making like kind of boring American guy miso, you know. And so I went there and I bought a nicer tub of miso, and I've realized that you can you can essentially take X vegetables, cook them down cook the thicker ones longer in oil and garlic and onion. And then when it's ready, you can throw in, I've been throwing in buckwheat noodles or soba noodles. And then uh, one tablespoon per serving, you're going to have of miso paste, a red or a dark miso. The white miso is kind of, kind of boring for me. And you have a meal. The key thing is don't boil miso because it's a fermented product and you will ruin all the probiotic qualities of it but when just before you're about to serve it uh pour off some of the broth mix in the miso into that because it's actually hard to get miso to dissolve completely because it is a it's a thick paste and you look like you know what you're doing (laughs) that's a great tip i love that that sounds wonderful yeah i'm all about looking what i know what i'm doing well that's how i am in the kitchen too (laughs) like i think i know how to fix a microwave but we're, we're on to phase two now. So <laughs> some very interesting comments there. It's kind of mainly good. But I'm uh, one guy, um, when his microwave breaks, he goes to the thrift store and buys another one. Well, that's a great idea, actually. If you're not going to fix it, going to the thrift store and buying one, because I got to think there's microwaves. Well, I think there's everything in thrift stores right now, because everybody has decluttered their house to the point where thrift stores can't take any anything more, but I bet you, you can find a microwave, um, at most Goodwills. I've been, uh, pretty successful at decluttering. I'm, I do it. I get rid of, I try and get rid of one thing a day and that way I don't get overwhelmed by the process. And I had some, uh, Macintosh, uh, system discs from like five years ago. They're for the, the Mac G5 or a power book or something. And I took a picture of the two discs. I put it on eBay for a dollar. And somebody bought them in like five hours. Oh, see, that's great. And I like that because I got it off my table 
and it went somewhere that someone needed it instead of into, mm -hmm. a, into a landfill. Right. And Apple right. doesn't sell that version of the software anymore anyway. I mean, they only sell, their whole idea is to, you know, uh, mothball everything so you have to buy a new one. <laughs> right. And so that's what I do. But I mean, I, I'm a big Apple fanboy. Oh, I have the picture here. Let me see if I can read. If you're curious, oh, they're Power Mac G5 OS X installed discs. It's a two disc set. Very exciting imagery of the two discs. <laughs> but it's a great way to get rid of stuff that you want, you don't want, but you hate the idea of filling up a landfill with. So I love that idea. At the office, we probably have cabinets of that stuff because we're a, actually exactly that stuff probably because we've been all Mac for the forever since since those first Macintosh computers came out yeah that's what we've used and I know we still have some of that original software that came with with you know, some things now that probably wouldn't be any use to anyone other than as a collector's item if anyone cares about that but some of the software that's maybe 10 years old I bet you that would go for sure yeah it's funny I have um the irony of this is that I have two of these small, they're Apple Macintosh wireless routers and they're, they're extenders or repeaters. So they, they grab the original signal from your base home router and they'll extend it more. And I tried to configure them. I wanted to plug one into my garage and I was actually going to run an ethernet wire to it. So it would extend the signal from the ethernet cable. And I, and I grab, I plugged it into my lap, my new laptop. And they said, uh, our software no longer support, supports these devices. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But they work. You know, they don't work at the newest wireless, you know, N range or G range or whatever. I'm like, I just want to, I just want to have Wi-Fi in my garage. <laughs> Such problems. Yeah. Needing Wi-Fi in your garage. I'm trying, to keep, trying to put Wi-Fi in the garage and not have to buy another Wi-Fi router. So if, some, if someone has a solution for me. Um, hold on, I'll, I'll read what the kind of thing it is. Hold on. Here, I'm holding them up to the microphone so you can see them, right? Um, <laughs> Airport Express Base Station. I have two of them. One is slightly older than the other, but but you can plug an Ethernet cable into them. You can plug a USB. You could plug speakers. You could play music from iTunes on your phone or your laptop through this. I mean, they were so versatile, that, but now I can't configure them for my new Wi-Fi. So if someone knows how to do that, radio at gardenfork.tv, and then I won't have to put them in the landfill. So there you go. Help me. All right. I Great. Think, think people have reached their destination. Yeah, I probably. So we went from soil. And then some, they're probably sitting in the parking lot. Cause this is waiting for us to finish so up. So exciting to listen to. <laughs> All right. You're on YouTube at the impatient gardener. And then also the impatient gardener.com. Dot com and on Instagram where you post beautiful pictures of flowers in the middle of winter. Yes, it's the thing that keeps me going. Yeah. Well, next time you're on, we're going to talk about seed starting. Great. I'm excited about that. Yeah, I have um, I have a box of seeds from last year. and I'm, I'm not going to buy any new seeds until I use up what I have. So. Oh, so you're way better than I am. I ordered with reckless abandon this year, and I'm a little afraid to even go into the box of all the other stuff I already had because I have a feeling I ordered a lot of things I already have, like the exact same variety even. I got caught up. Okay. <laughs> all right, everyone. Um, I, I can't remember what I say at the end of the show, so uh, email us, please, radio at gardenfork.tv and uh, make it a great day and we will see you. Bye. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots of hollowbooks.com and our music is licensed from uniquetracks.com.